when did you start to think that something was maybe wrong in your head? Okay, so we have, we're going to start with like a couple of quick fire questions, as we call them. Um, so one of the, the first one is how are you feeling today, just generally? What's your mood? I'm actually feeling really good today. I'm feeling quite calm and uplifted, positive. Yeah. 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 And what do you think makes you feel calm? I think today I'm feeling calm because I've really taken care of myself. I've given myself what I need. So I meditated in the morning. I called a friend when I was getting stressed before it got too bad. And then I took myself out into the sun and nature. It was all very nurturing. Mm. And when you say you kind of felt stressed, what do you think brought that on? I feel like I often get sort of anxiety generally. Um, And I can now I can really feel it creeping on. So I try and do things to help me manage it rather than in the past. It might have become really, really overwhelming and it kind of spirals. And I feel like it can come, it can come from anything really, like an unanswered message. And I start getting paranoid of have I said the wrong thing? Have I upset somebody or a work thing? Or just sometimes it's not even linked to anything. And I just wake up with this sort of like, just sort of general anxiety. Mm, and have you always had that since you were a kid or does that start later on I don't think I have always had it I think I've probably always been quite susceptible to it so I've had it in moments um but I definitely feel it's as I've got older I don't know probably I think it probably could also just be like a PTSD um side effect to be honest because it that was all yeah they, they they told me when I got my diagnosis that anxiety is kind of linked to it okay. so I do think it's all linked so following the accident it yeah. definitely yeah was noticeably kind of worse yeah. So will you talk to us about how, you know, n- none of our listeners really know about the PTSD and why it started initially. So will you just inform them and just speak about what happened to you? Yeah, of course. So it was almost 10 years ago now, which feels crazy. It was February 2013. Yeah. Um, and I was in Thailand traveling and I was 22 at the time and I was just on one of those big overnight buses that kind of we were going from Bangkok to the islands down south and I was asleep in the middle of the night when there was a huge crash and the bus kind of tumbled over that's how I remember it but I think what what actually happened was a wheel exploded um on the motorway and so the bus kind of like fell into a valley um and it was a really bad accident quite a few people died um and a lot of people were really severely injured and when I woke up I think I kind of have pieced together that I was probably unconscious for about 45 minutes um and when I woke up um I didn't have my glasses on and I just everything was like it was like a nightmare there was just like mangled metal and it was dark and I couldn't see properly and I could see like somebody's hand in front of me um that just wasn't moving and I couldn't see a body I could just see a hand I think they'd been like trapped underneath something I think now probably it was someone who died and anyway I just saw like a lot of traumatic things um and I one of my friends I just made traveling he he just lost his leg and so when I woke up it was kind of just me and the most badly injured and the dead people on the bus everybody who was okay had already got off so it was kind of like waking up to this this war zone, really. Yeah, and so next step, so what happened after that? You were taken presumably to the hospital. Yeah, I remember I stayed on the bus for a little while with um with the people who were really badly injured, just kind of trying to comfort them, like stem the blood on my friend's leg where he'd lost his, his foot um, and do things like that. And then I got off the bus and that's something I actually felt a bit of guilt about because... I remember I, I kind of had this thought of, oh, I should have stayed longer with them. But at the time, all I was thinking of is why is no one coming? Like, why is no one coming to save us? So I just kind of like jumped out a window and tried to get help to get um, like, I guess, the emergency services to kind of cut the metal to get into the bus to get to the worst, you know, the most the badly injured people. But it was a complete mess. We're in the middle of nowhere. It was a countryside. There were no proper emergency services. No one spoke English. Anyway, eventually I went with some people to this kind of, it wasn't even a hospital, it was like a hut. It was a hut. 
and they did the most extreme like i guess sorry most essential medical things there but it was all just quite traumatic and i had to kind of like there were people who yeah just i had to get um one guy's name and his date of birth and he couldn't speak he had to just sort of blink at me so it was like it was crazy i had to kind of like say letters and numbers to get him to blink and anyway because that was because i decided that all i could do was practical stuff so i was like calling the embassy and trying to get get everyone's names on record so that they could notify their next of kin i just went to like full-on practical mode um but yeah and then we went to another hospital and it's all yeah it was intense yeah it sounds yeah pretty awful and so and how long did you then remain in the country before you could get home to the UK. so my mum was like desperate for me to come home ASAP and she was like I'm booking you a flight I'm coming over and I was like no I want to stay with everybody so I stayed out of choice for another three or four days um just basically looking after everyone um and I made the embassy come um the British embassy come to the hospital in the middle of nowhere and <laughs> they were like I kind of went into like journalist mode and I was like you will get here you've got citizens here and I um yeah I kind of just hovered around the hospital trying to help everyone and when everybody's friends and family came to came to support them and flew over that's when I left to go back to England so it's probably like five or six days after the accident yeah and I mean incredibly traumatic to just be alone in that kind of situation and to not really have much support and to also be surrounded by people who aren't necessarily sort of compass mentors, you know, they're not Mm -hmm. fully there. And yeah, pretty, uh, just God, and the flight home, I mean, what were you thinking on the flight home? Yeah, that was the worst flight ever. I I I think the the hardest thing for me is, there was a lot going on. I was, I was physically uninjured and everybody around me who'd been sat near me was incredibly injured um, or they died. So, you know, and a girl I'd been speaking to earlier, like her dead body was literally underneath me and her boyfriend found her in front of me. So all I just kept reliving this on the plane home. I just relived every like traumatic thing. And I kept thinking, why me? Like, why am I the one that's okay? Um, and this girl, I was like, she was like prettier than me. She was cooler than me. Like, why is she dead and I'm alive? And it sounds really banal, but that's those are the kind of thoughts that I was just plagued by the whole journey home. It doesn't sound banal <laughs> at all. <laughs> Ridiculous! it sounds like you know i mean anyone's worst nightmare i mean it's sort of unbelievable that you were still able to get yourself on the flight alone and sort of hold yourself together i Mm. think it's unbelievable so then talk us through what were the next steps so you got home with obviously no overt physical injury um but i mean when did you start to think that something was maybe wrong in your head so it wasn't me who thought it it was my mum um i knew i was not happy (laughs) i knew i was miserable and sad and everything was awful but i didn't know necessarily that i needed kind of you know support with my mental health but my mum she said that when i'd called her like an hour after the accident or i don't know as soon as i could get a phone i called her and i was just screaming at her like there was there were bodies everywhere like there was blood there were bodies and just like like, i don't know she was like you just did not sound okay and she was like i just knew you were going to need support so um, she managed to kind of like sort private healthcare and basically get me um, a therapist like almost instantly. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. And it, I, I, then, I think I started having therapy like two weeks after the accident because my mum was just, I think she was just so aware that it was going to leave, you know, have a really big impact on me. And out of interest, what did the therapist focus on first? Did they diagnose you with PTSD from, from the outset or did they just sort of mm. start to get you to talk about it and slowly open up yeah it was I can't remember the order actually because I remember now I did actually see a psychiatrist I think I had to see a psychiatrist first yeah who diagnosed yeah, the PTSD and I, that's when I, I remember I got diagnosed with PTSD and comorbid depression and I did not understand what that means and I actually don't think I still I don't really know what the comorbid thing means I've forgotten but I remember just think, seeing those words and being like oh god like that looks bad and the PTSD I was kind of in denial I think because I was a bit like why do I have what I it was just in an accident like I really only associated PTSD then with war and like soldiers coming back and shell shock like for some reason that was the only association I had in that moment and I just thought this is ridiculous that I've got PTSD um and I remember my when I then went to therapy my therapist he gave me the option he was like there are two ways we can work this and he suggested EMDR 
which I now know a lot about. But at the time, it was alien to me. I was like, what you, I'm, I didn't get it. It was like blinking and kind of hypnotherapy to heal me. And I was like, this just makes no sense to me. So I decided just to do it the kind of more traditional way where we spoke about the accident and kind of did CBT and worked on things together. Yeah, so you touched on a lot there. So yeah. <laughs> first of all, I think it's interesting for for listeners who don't know is that, you know, going to a psychiatrist always before going to a therapist who sort of diagnoses and like labels the problem, as it were, and then refers you on to a therapist who supposedly recommends the best kind of treatment for you. Mm-hmm. And I've actually had experience of EMDR as well, and which is eye movement desensitization regulation, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a very weird form of treatment. And for someone who's never had therapy before as well, I can imagine mm-hmm. it's kind of quite a sort of plunge into the dark. Um, and hopefully in a later episode, we might get someone to talk about EMDR. But the CBT form of therapy, did that help? And what did that entail? Yeah, it did help. It was, it was basically just, we'd start by talking about the accident. And then my feelings around it. And I guess the biggest thing, I remember at the beginning, the biggest thing my therapist kept saying was, you know, you're allowed to be sad about this. Like you're allowed to not make jokes. You're allowed to actually just like sit in the enormity of what's happened to you. And I, because I wasn't, I was kind of like making jokes and kind of like, I don't know, almost performing as I spoke about it. I was like putting on an act. Um, And like maybe being quite self-deprecating as well just a lot of like very british kind of like (laughs) coping mechanisms um and he helped me just actually feel what happened and accept all my feelings and just cry and cry so there were so many sessions where i just sobbed um and then we worked through the stuff that i could let go of i kind of i can't remember what he said at the time but now i think of it as I had layer one of like grief at what I'd been through and shock um, and then layer two of me judging myself for it. And I realized that I can't get rid of layer one, but I can get rid of layer two. And so the CBT really helped me get rid of this like inner talk that I had to myself about, you know, you should have done this. This was your fault. Why did you do this? Um, also, because I'd been traveling with a friend who luckily she was OK, but she'd broken some ribs and it was her first time traveling properly traveling and I traveled quite a bit and I felt kind of guilty that I'd brought her there and told her everything would be fine and I felt guilty that I'd left the bus and I'd left the really injured people when I went to go and get help um yeah so I was just carrying all of this guilt and also then completely irrational guilt as well that why why not me Mm, no I mean I can imagine and CBT cognitive behavioral therapy is all about accessing that inner critic which sort of It's like, I remember once being described um, to it as being like, you know, Joe's always going to be banging on the windows and is going to be trying to get in the house through the door. And if you shut the door, then he's going to come in through the roof. And if you come in through, you know, whatever it is, and he's always going to try and get a seat at the table. And actually, if you try and shut him out, the sort of the banging is just going to get louder and louder and louder before it kind of just drives you absolutely Mm -hmm. insane. Whereas what you need to do is say, okay, come on, Joe, like, welcome, welcome into my home and you can sit at the table. And you can, you know, whir away as you are and you can give me all this kind of crap and this endless flow of criticism. But actually, I'm just going to sit here and I'm not going to I'm going to try and not listen to you Mm. because it's kind of that acceptance whilst kind of just knowing that you're not going to get rid of it, I guess. It's um, but it's really, really hard. And it's (laughs) it's all all very well sort of, you know, sitting in a therapist's room and sort of, you know, practicing it and then when you get out you're sort of immediately like thrown into the the claws of it again yeah but yeah another thing I want to go back to is that you you just said something that I think is a lot of people's perceptions around PTSD is that like it shouldn't be someone who's young and been involved in you know a coach accident we associate PTSD with war veterans mm-hmm. and actually it's very prevalent between I think, well, amongst girls between the ages of 16 and 24, I think Mm -hmm. it is. It's sort of some of the highest rates of PTSD. And it's something that we've only really just started recognizing and speaking about. And it can arise from all sorts of traumatic events. So 
yeah, do you know much about that and PTSD and how it can, you know, other instances in which it's developed in other people and people you've spoken to who have also suffered from it? I guess, I mean, I don't know huge amounts, but in some of the work I've done as a journalist, like, right, you know, looking into this topic and writing around it, I think the big thing I've realised is um, that a lot of it comes from violence against women and girls. And as we know, like, you know, women and girls are much more likely to experience violence than men, whether it's sexual abuse, domestic violence, all that kind of stuff. And that, that leaves its mark. And yeah, there's all kinds of different traumas that can lead to PTSD. And I do think as a society, we still have that view that I did before, you know, I experienced it myself, that it was to do with war veterans. And actually, it's really funny because I recently made friends with um, a guy who used to work, who used to be in the army. Um, and he served in Afghanistan. He was diagnosed with PTSD. And when he told me, I still felt like, oh, God, his PTSD is worse than mine. Like his PTSD is more important than mine. And mine felt like, oh, no, I was just in an accident. It's not a thing. Like, no, no, it's not. And I think it was really interesting to me to notice that I did that because this was quite recent. Um, and I think that's probably just quite, you know, something that a lot of people would do in our society. And we kind of maybe try and put mental health things on a scale and mine's worse than yours, yours is worse than mine. And actually, it's just allowing there to be space for all of these things and, you know, not comparing just these things happen for so many different reasons and they're all equally valid. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. I mean, I know with my eating disorder and anorexia, you know, I was never at a low enough weight to be admitted into hospital and to be on a drip. So when I sort of say I've had, oh, I have, you know, an eating disorder, I sort of feel like, is it actually justified? You yeah. know, should, you know, as I'm talking to a girl who's kind of completely skeletal, I feel like I can't say that I'm anorexic because, but it's a mindset. And actually, you know, as you said, there's no scale in mental health. It's, it's this idea that, oh, like, you know, mine's not as bad because I didn't go through this or, you know, my OCD isn't as bad as yours yeah. because I've, you know, got, I'm lucky in that, I, you know, my family have supported me and it hasn't, you know, caused me to feel suicidal or whatever it is. But it's, this is the whole thing, the stigma that we're trying to kind of dispel around it. It's just, it's not the case. And it's really harmful. And that's part of almost the disorder is kind of, it's beating you up about the fact that yours isn't bad enough yeah. because, you know, and why do you deserve to like give yourself a label of having PTSD or OCD or an addiction because you never got to that breaking point that they did. Um, but it's always going to do that. So I think a lot of recovery is about acknowledging that and accepting it. Completely. Um, and I, I always think the phrase um, compare is despair is so good because every time I hear it, I'm like, yes. Was I comparing myself over something quite, you know, I don't know, small and ordinary, like, mm. I don't know, something quite superficial or a job thing compared, or even if it's mental health, it's like, whenever I fall into that comparing mindset, it's going to lead to absolute despair. And it's just need, I just need to focus on my recovery and my road. And that's it. Yeah. Comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, many good proverbs and phrases absolutely. about it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so going back to when you got home and you were in therapy, what, what were your friends, I mean, what was your support network? What was their reaction to what you were going through? I remember I felt incredibly lonely. Um, and I felt lonely in those days in Thailand after the accident. I remember that was, my, that was the feeling I felt the most, like loneliness. And every night I would just sob and feel so lonely. And it wasn't just because I was alone. And, you know, I had no friends or family there. I just felt lonely because I felt that nobody I knew could relate to what I was going through. And it felt, I just didn't know how, I just wanted someone who'd be like, yeah, I get it. And there was no one who could do that. Um, and also, most people in the accident had a partner, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and I didn't. And that made me feel really alone too, because I was like, I don't have my one person. Um, and then when I came back home, I still felt that loneliness. I was like, there's just no one person who's here for me. And there's no one in my life who gets it. I remember like my family tried so hard to take care of me and be kind and they, they were and they did, but it just, it, it was almost like I, I wasn't open to it. Like I was really quite cold and prickly because I was just really not okay. And I think everyone expected me to be quite sad and fragile, but actually I was angry and maybe my, my trauma didn't look like what everyone expected it to. 
So there was this kind of, yeah, weird disconnect. And I felt like I was, yeah, I just didn't know how to talk to people. And my good friends would, you know, come and visit me um, and try and talk to me about it. And I just, I didn't know how to be real about it. I could, I could try and make jokes and everything was fine. But when I was real, they just didn't really know what to say back. You know, these were also like people in their early 20s who just had no idea what to say. So yeah, the whole experience was really lonely. Do you think anyone could have done anything that would have made it any better? I think if it happened to me now, it would be really different because I feel like my friends would know what to say. And I don't know if that's just I've got different friends and who like get me more or just the conversation has changed so much and we're so much more aware of mental health. Um, because really all I needed was for someone to be like, you know, I can't relate to what you're going through, but it's like, I get it. Like, I, you know, I, let me hold your hands and I'll just be here with you while you feel your pain. I just needed someone to sit with me while I was in the pain. Yeah, I think that's another, like, a really, a crucial thing that people need to hear, of, like, you know, <clears throat> who are supporting people who mm -hmm. are going through something because the immediate human tendency or inclination is to want to help and fix it. Fixing and is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> Just let it be. Yeah. Just let and it be. Particularly with a parent, you know, yeah. it's like, why aren't you moving like incrementally sort of, you know, up the ladder, you yeah. know, why are you going backwards? You know, oh my God, you know, and then they descend into this absolute sort of like fury about it and they then get angry, which then just exacerbates your guilt and your, you know, and, and the condition just worsens. It's like a snowball effect. And, yeah. and then you start to feel emotions that actually aren't even necessarily directly related to your d disorder or your mental mm -hmm. health condition. It's actually a, a lot about them. Um, and they don't see it that way. So it's great that, yeah, I mean, I think it would be fantastic if we were able to educate people really around what to do if someone is suffering from PTSD. And actually, these are sort of the things that you said, you just want someone to sit with you and hold your hand and to just say, let's go for a walk. and We don't even need to talk. Like, yeah, I'll just be with exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. Because I think this is a thing. It's the isolating and the loneliness with any kind of mental illness, which is just so crippling. And you feel like this social pariah because yeah. I don't know if you experience this, but at times I've definitely had that feeling of just like my friends think I'm a patient and they treat me like I'm this sort of low life and they don't invite me to the parties because I'm clearly like not going to want to go because I don't drink and I don't stay out until like 5 a.m. They don't invite me on the kind of, you know, the big group trips or whatever because that's not really my thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to feel even more lonely yeah. and desperate and isolated. And then the inner critic just starts like wearing away. So, you know, Joe outside the house, like just starts like <laughs> banging, you know, even louder. And it's, it's a really vicious cycle. Yeah, it is. Um, so no, so what spurred you on to then start writing about it? Because you started writing your book, your first book, didn't you? Mm. The one about virginity yeah uh, was it or wasn't it about you Radhika? um but that was during that period of you being alone at home yeah yeah that was just it's so funny that I wrote that book because it's just it's a comedy and it's not serious at all I mean it has some serious you know themes and stuff but it, it, it was not at all linked to what I was going through but I just really wanted a distraction and in the past like as a kid when when I needed to distract when I needed to get away from difficult feelings I would read and that was kind of my savior but this was too big to read like books were not I could I couldn't concentrate books were not helping me so I realized I needed to create um and yeah I started writing and I wrote this novel and I wrote it I think I wrote it in like the March after the accident in February which is crazy and I would just be at my mum's house and I would just go and sit in the Cafe Nero down the road and just write this book. And it took me out of my pain and it gave me respite and it helped me laugh. It was actually really healing. Like, yes, I was kind of running away from painful feelings, but I needed a break. Like, you can't sit in painful feelings 24-7. You're allowed, like, some time off. <laughs> and this book was my time off from, from the pain. Um, and, yeah, it's a, it was a comedy about, like, I guess the sexual pressures and expectations young girls face which is so different to what I was going through, but it felt, it felt right to talk about. Um, and it was a book I kind of wrote just for my friends. It was, 
and I put lots of funny stories in that happened to lots of people I knew um and it was kind of just meant to be for them but then by the time I finished it I was like actually it's quite good (laughs) and I ended up getting an agent and it got published and then I got on to write more books and I'm now writing my fourth book and yeah that journey all started then and I think actually do you know what part of it was also because I'd almost died and almost dying and seeing people my my age who died made me think what matters to me what would I have wanted to do if I knew I was going to die and I'd always wanted to write a book and I was just, and I'd actually started this book that summer I forgot about that yeah I'd written chapter one like six months before the accident and I just forgot about it life got in the way I was like oh it's probably not very good and then actually when this accident happened I was like no I want to finish that book that's amazing and such a healthy coping mechanism yeah. really because I mean a lot of people would have turned to drugs drinking yeah. you know which we know about PTSD um addictive behaviors and self-destructive yeah. behaviors and actually to write is such an incredible outlet and yeah and it sort of sounds like your friends I think you have sort of said one of your friends was sort of so desperate for the next chapter or something she went on she was like I'm going on holiday I need you to write like write more write oh, more yeah. write more well, <laughs> no, that, that was, was later with, book, was that? that was with my book that's out now 30 things I love about myself um but, but yeah my friends have, I kind of wrote the books for my friends and then actually yeah shared them with the world which is really lovely and do you think it gave you I mean would you say it's given you a big confidence boost being a published author has that helped with the sort of inner critic (laughs) actually no (laughs) because my inner critic is not very rational and doesn't really care about things um like that um I really thought when it happened when I first got that call like off email whatever it was you know your book's going to be published you've got a book deal I remember feeling like ecstasy for about two seconds and then I started and then I instantly went back into like oh god but you know and worries anxiety and I just remember thinking wow I thought this would be amazing and it's lasted literally about two seconds that euphoria and then it just goes straight to oh but now I've got to worry about this and I've got to do this and is it going to be good enough and how's it going to sell and oh my god um yeah and that that actually that lesson that experience taught me a lot it taught me that external things are not going to give me that peace and calmness and self-esteem that I want I've got to give those to myself internally I'm not going to get them from achievements Mm, and that's so true I yeah that's so true on so many levels I think we always think that that you know the bar is sort of once we reach that bar it's going to give us this epiphany and we're going to be fixed and then all our problems are going to disappear and in fact then the bar just gets higher or it's another anxiety it leads to more anxiety because you know, we've got to reach these perfectionists of levels yeah. that are just not attainable. And then it's the panic of what other people might think. And then it's the panic of what next. And then, yeah, it's just endless. And I think that's a sign of anxiety in the anxious mind is that it's always going to latch on to something else. And so, as you said, it's coming to that point where you can accept, okay, that's my mind and it's always going to do that. So how am I going to learn how to love myself and develop some kind of self-compassion? Which, Radhika, is my next question. So you then went on this journey of developing this form of self-love and self-compassion, which sounds, I mean, talk to us about that. (laughs) I mean, yeah, learning to love yourself. Yeah, it's basically the most important thing I've ever ever done in my life. And I'm still doing it. I'm still on that journey, Um, which I didn't realise, I don't think, (laughs) until like a year or two ago. I was like, oh, it's still here. Um... So yeah, that that accident was maybe when I was around 22 and it took me a few years to really realise that this was the answer to kind of go inwards and love myself. Like, yes, I had lots of therapy and support, but it was more handling the trauma, I think. Um, And then, yeah, in my maybe late 20s, when I was 26, 27, I um, ended a relationship I was in where I've been getting a lot of, I've been getting a lot of like safety from that relationship. And then I ended it because I just knew it wasn't the right thing long term. And I ended up leaving my job where I've been getting a lot of validation in that job. And suddenly I was just single freelance and sad. Um, and I realized I had to start giving myself this love and approval that I'd been seeking externally my entire life. Um, and also because I do have perfectionist tendencies, I now call myself a recovering perfectionist because. I have been on such a journey to let go of that perfectionism and that illusion of control. 
Um, and yeah, I just, I realized that I needed to focus on loving myself. Um, I am quite a hardworking person. So when I give myself a thing to do, I'm like, I'm going to do this. And I really like basically just started tackling self-love like it was, I don't know, an exam. I was like, I'm going to do self-love. <laughs> <laughs> and I started to like focus on changing my inner voice like the negative critic who's always so mean to me and always picks up on the negative stuff that I do and doesn't see the positives, I would try and counter that. And I would do exercises, like try and write positive things to myself. Or if someone had said something, if I got a work email that had some criticism and some positive things, I would like underline the positive things and write them in my diary and just try and like really absorb it because my mind was so used to only focusing on the negative. And yeah, I, I started to kind of, accepts my personality and also my appearance and I ended up doing this whole campaign called side profile selfie hashtag side profile selfie about loving big noses I'd never liked my nose and I'd been waiting for somebody to do like a body positivity thing about noses and no one did and I was like okay I'm just gonna have to do it myself and at that time I did not love my nose I didn't but I I tried and the feedback I got from people was so positive that it actually helped me on that journey to eventually fully accept and love myself physically and I feel yeah it's that was kind of like five years ago I probably started that work and I'm still very much doing that work I can now say I love myself and I accept myself fully but there are days where it's hard and there are days where I can't and then there are days where um I don't know I kind of start falling back in those old habits and I have to be like no come on and the thing I'm really focusing on now is compassion because I've got to a place where I accept myself and I accept all the things I've done, but I'm not always kind to myself about it. So I feel like that's my next step. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm intrigued to hear what the secret formula is. I think <laughs> we're all on that journey, but I think it's incredible that you found, yeah, I mean, you found tools and you found methods which have worked and clearly it's it's just so admirable and it's so inspiring to hear from someone who has embarked on that journey and you know little things like underlining the positive comments in an email you know great I'm going to start doing that yeah, do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then you know accepting body parts of yourself that you know you we all have that we all have features that we hate and that we think other you know other people I have this thing about my tummy and at times when I was you know, really underweight, I would have a smaller frame, but then I would get this bloated tummy mm. and I would be asked, I mean, you cannot believe how often it would happen whether I was pregnant. Wow. And I would be mortified, you know, to the point where I just, I was like, what, what I mean, what is the point of this? I've, not only am I a slave to this illness, but now I'm being asked whether I'm pregnant. I mean, are you having a laugh? And, um, it's that thing where you always feel like everyone's focusing on that negative feature. It's kind of like you always feel, so I always feel whenever ever anyone's looking at me like that, eyes go to my tummy and like, you know, it's just that immediate sort of suspicion. Um, and it's actually so important just to learn to embrace it and to actually just say, hey, you know, I love my nose, I love my tummy and to sort of give it a, a, like a, a kind, nice name. And it's, yeah. it's one of those things that is so hard, but I think that radical sort of acceptance and compassion is just so, so vital. So yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. That's so, yeah, really, really lovely to hear. And, and going back to the, your sort of process within the, the therapy of the, for, for your PTSD, um, how long did that last and is that ongoing or I mean I don't really know how it works so I had that therapy for maybe two years but not in not every week but at the beginning it was every week and then it kind of shifted and then we took some we took a we took some breaks um, but I would say I was kind of with that therapist for around two years and then I guess there just came a point where I felt, oh no, actually, no, it was longer than that. Um, <laughs> I'm just realizing when I was in a relationship, I was still kind of seeing that therapist, uh, the same one. I think we stopped seeing each other regularly after two years, but he was kind of still in my life and available if I needed him, which made me feel really safe because I knew that the program, we'd finished the program and we'd kind of, I'd got to a place where 
my stuff was manageable. Like my mental health stuff was manageable. And I knew that I had my tools, I had my coping mechanisms, but he was still there in case I needed him. Um, which is just so helpful to have because as much as like what I found when I was doing therapy for my PTSD was as much as we focus on the accident, it's also a whole load of other stuff. It wasn't just talking about the accident every week. It was talking about normal life. And it was also going into my past and I go, I won't go into details, but you know, like traumas that happened to me in my past. And that maybe those were the original things that had kind of sparked everything. And then actually it was later when this obvious thing happened that it kind of reignited everything and made it so much worse. And we talked about coping mechanisms I had as a child that had helped me as a child, but now it was time to let them go and find healthier ones. Mm. So it was a, like a really amazing process and I'm really grateful for it. So that was really interesting because I think some people try to separate out, they s- distinguish between trauma and PTSD. Mm. And in fact, it seems that actually there is, there is a sort of build up, like with anything, that there's a seed that's planted and quite often it just needs that, that you say it needs to be ignited in some kind of catastrophe or disaster event. And actually then the PTSD gets diagnosed, but often it can be as a result of an anxious mind. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of piecing all those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. Um, but it's, yeah, did you find, so did they continue with the CBT? Was that what you found the most helpful in terms yeah. of the tools to help you? That's what I had. Um, I had CBT then. And it was really helpful because I've, I've always been quite a practical person. And I found, I found it really helpful to have like worksheets and like columns <laughs> and things that could help me kind of tackle the things that made no sense to me. Um, and now, now I, don't, I don't think of it in those terms anymore. It's kind of just really integrated into the way I, I handle things and think about my issues. But yeah, it was CBT. And then I didn't have therapy for a while. And then I actually had therapy again in lockdown um, for almost a year, which was really helpful. And I, I, it's amazing because I only got therapy for the first time because of this accident. And now I realise it's such an amazing tool and I'm so lucky to be able to access it and get it if ever I'm in a place where I'm struggling and I need, I need help. And I had a different kind of therapy in lockdown. It was, I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> I've forgotten the name, but it was kind of like, it sounds really weird, but he was almost, I called him my spiritual therapist, mm-hmm. um, which, because I've forgotten the name, but it's a kind of therapy, but it was a kind of therapy that made so much sense to me and where I was at that point in my life, where it was all about, He'd say like, you know, where is the feeling in your body? What does it look like? How does it feel? And I'd like almost close my eyes and visualize that feeling and maybe make my peace with it or see the positives in it. Yeah. yeah. And I found it really helpful because it was what I needed in that moment. And it's, I feel like I've definitely found, you know, a lot of peace and spirituality in recent years. So that made sense to where I was at at the moment, that kind of treatment. Yeah, because there's that book, isn't there, about, you know, trauma being held inside the body. Yeah. Um, And I think there's a lot to be said for it. And I think certainly on my journey, I actually find the hands-on healing and the sort of visualization of where you're holding tension in the body can actually be incredibly powerful because Mm. sometimes you're just done with talking. I don't know about you, but it's just like, how many times can you go over something and how many times can you dig around and do that kind of Freudian analysis about your past and replaying these events? And actually... I think at times it can just re-traumatize you and quite often revisiting these events and not talking necessarily about the accident, but um, I'm, t- you know, in terms of like what, what you experienced growing up and then what you experienced in adolescence, it's like you've kind of uncovered everything so many times and it's just like, I don't want to revisit it all again. What can I do now proactively to move forward? And like you, I'm quite sort of, you know, I like, tools and I like to know how they're going to help and how I can implement them in my daily life I don't really you know I've kind of you know you understand where you know intelligent humans we can understand what's kind of gone on how it might affect us Mm -hmm. now and in our confidence but we're like yeah but now how do I sort of almost like repair the damage in my daily routines Mm -hmm. and it's yeah I think it can be really powerful and so now what's sort of with your book and stuff, what's, what's next? So, yeah, I've just, my book 30 Things I Love About Myself is out and I'm working on another one, which doesn't have a title yet. <laughs> but it will be out next year. And it's actually, that book's all about healing. 
it's about a woman who um has got a really bad relationship with her sisters and her family and her dad dies and they kind of all come together um for like the hindu prayers you have to kind of be together for two weeks and she's got an autoimmune condition and it's just a lot about kind of internal healing and going and she had a childhood trauma that she uncovers and yeah it was actually a really lovely book to write because I feel like I feel like when I write my books I'm not writing about me but I'm writing about themes that I care about and themes that I'm thinking about so yeah lots of healing in the next one <laughs> that sounds amazing and then are you still doing your journalism is that ongoing yeah I'm still doing journalism I'm also writing for tv now I'm like working on developing some of my own shows and I've started writing for Mallory Towers on CBBC, which is like the most wholesome, joyous thing. Oh my God. <laughs> so really. really enjoying the stuff I'm writing right now. Yeah. And then the sort of investigative journalism sort of profiles, because I think that's, you know, your main, that's what you enjoy doing, isn't it? Doing sort of more long form sort of stories, yeah. really getting stuck into topics. I mean, do you think you'll take that into a, I'd know into more of a mental health sphere or do you think you'll just continue to I feel really lucky with my career to be honest because with journalism I feel like it always ref the things I write about tend to reflect what I'm thinking about and what I care about whether that's editors coming to me or me coming to them it's just kind of panned out that way so yeah I am I do often write about mental health and I've written a lot about loneliness and how damaging that can be um and yeah it's important to me to keep writing honestly about these things that i care about that affect me that affect people i know and care about yeah i think we need to keep speaking about it all we do and i think that was what was so powerful about your recent article in the telegraph about ptsd was um or not so recent but you know it's it's just so important that more people like you who have a voice actually you know, sort of do write about it and do dispel this whole myth about PTSD just being something that affects veterans and something that affects men who are in, you know, in war zones. Um, yeah. And I think it is really important that as many people as possible can talk about it because the problem when it's just one or two people speaking about it is then we then think, oh, well, that's the experience of it. And it's got to look like that. And if my PTSD doesn't look like hers, then maybe mine's wrong <laughs> and actually the more people that talk about it the more we see okay it can affect you in so many different ways because I had my experience but I'm sure other people you know have very different experiences of PTSD and they're all just as valid and they all deserve to be talked about. No I totally agree and I think that's the thing I found about OCD is that the more people who open up about it the more you realize that a I'm not alone yeah. um, and that there are so many people out there who are really struggling and B, actually, it, yeah, it comes in many different forms and guises. And actually, it, it, it almost makes you, it, it sort of really helps with, the, for me, it certainly helped with the journey to sort of towards healing because, mm. you know, being able to almost laugh at the, the sort of ridiculousness of what goes on in your head and the sort of mental dialogue when you sort of think it all makes sense and it's rational. And yet when you see someone else's behaviours, you're like, oh my God, that is just <laughs> totally weird and like off the charts. So, but you, you then think, well, they think the same, exactly the same about me. And I think it's almost being able to sometimes have more humour and a more lighthearted approach to sort of how we look at ourselves because with the loneliness and going, going back to that, it's sort of when you are lonely, all you do is ruminate and all you do is sort of almost you know, you get into that mindset of convincing yourself that what's going on in your head is actually really real and really, really true. And for someone who's not suffering, they don't really get that. Mm -hmm. But for someone who is, you know, suffering from a si the same condition or a similar condition, they get it. Like your thoughts seem very, very real. And I think that's why lockdown especially was so detrimental for so many of us um, was because suddenly, you know, you are faced with, total isolation and your thoughts start to become a reality and and suddenly you're back almost to square one you sort of think you've moved through all this sort of trauma and you've really processed it and it's never fully in a box and processed it's something we have to learn to manage and like you said that's why the self-compassion and self-acceptance is so important because once you've mastered that you know hopefully that and you never fully master it obviously but that's a real Kind of weapon against it um so yeah i think it's brilliant that you're speaking about it and thank you so so much for your time today it's like yeah invaluable 
And just to close, I want to ask you a few quick fire questions. So what's one thing that if you had no constraints and all the courage in the world that you would do? Oh, um, what would I do if I had all the courage in the world? I don't know. I feel like something really physical, like a challenge, like a kind of a climbing a mountain kind of challenge, because I don't do that sort of thing. But <laughs> it's like so, it's, I would love that. <laughs> summiting Mount Everest. Yeah. We'll have summiting you. Summiting a mountain. We'll have you yeah. up there in no time at all. <laughs> like this time next year, I have no fish. <laughs> Uh, um, and how would you spend your ideal 24 hours? I feel like I already spent my 24, idea, 24 hours in an ideal way. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah, I feel, yeah, very, very lucky. Like, bit of yoga, bit of nature, bit of seeing my friends, bit of writing. Yeah, and hanging out with my cat. That's me done. <laughs> Great. Um, and then what drains your energy still? Um like situations where I feel I have to be fake or I can't be my fully be myself or I'm like repressing parts of myself small talk small talk drains my energy drinks <laughs> parties yes Radhika thank you so much you've been absolutely fantastic oh, um, thank you so much it's been so lovely to talk